Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining me today in the locker room. I'm Alan Locker. Have you ever wondered what happened to a long lost love? What if that person suddenly reappeared in your life exactly as you remembered them? What would you do? The new film, A Case of Blue, follows Richard, played by actor Steven Schnetzer, a man who just gets that opportunity. A Case of Blue is a compelling romantic comedy, a romantic drama, sorry, shot in iconic New York City locations. The film is about a re recent retiree who attends a life drawing class in New York and encounters the free-spirited model played by Annapur Annapurna Syrium, who resembles a long-lost love. The film also stars Tracy Shane from Who Play, uh, who Plays His Wife and Ken Balton, who plays his best buddy. The movie is written and directed by Student Academy Award winner Dana H. Glazer. A Case of Blue has won awards at the Chelsea New York City Film Festival and Imagine This Women's International Film Festival in New York City. The movie is currently available on most streaming platforms, including Amazon, iTunes, Apple TV, and more. Please welcome all three uh, to the locker room, Steven Schnetzer, writer, director, Dana H. Glazer, and producer, Suzanne ordas Corey. Suzanne, Dana, I got tongue-tied my apologies to all of you. <laughs> you did fine. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for being here. Dana, I didn't say it to you backstage. I said it to Steven. I really, really enjoyed the film. I can't Congratulations. Hear you. Congratulations. Um, Suzanne can't hear us. You might need to unplug your mic. Suzanne, can you hear us? But anyway, Dana, I love the film. I thought it was really sweet and beautiful. Um, I gave a brief synopsis. Yeah. So you, in your own words, tell me, you know, what the film is about and where, where the idea stemmed from. Oh, wow. So the film uh, is about a recent retiree who discovers, who who is given a... Uh, a gift certificate to go to an arts class in New York City, which was a place that he went to when he was in his early 20s. Uh, his, his family wants him to reconnect. with. I the... can't hear you, Alan. No. <laughs> um... <laughs> there you go. You can hear us now? Yes. Okay. Uh, don't, don't touch anything. No. <laughs> <laughs> don't touch anything. Sorry, Danny. Continue. No, no, no worries. Uh, so anyway, uh, it's a, it's it's about uh, this recent retiree who gets a uh, is given a gift by his family to go to a, a, a life drawing class in New York City, and uh, this is a passion that he had when he was in his twenties that he put aside to be more practical, and so he goes to this class, which is the same studio that he was at when he was in his twenties, and the woman who is the model is the spitting image of the woman who was the model when he was in his 20s, who he had a romance with. And so it kind of throws his life in a degree of turmoil. <laughs> that, that's a good uh, that's a good understatement. Stephen, uh, what drew you to this role? The stage in my life that I'm at, um, the. The journey for the character. Um, meeting and auditioning with Dana and also uh, the quality of the actresses and actor um, that I read for during the audition process. In a, that's it in a nutshell. Um, yeah, I was curious because, it, you know, you, you just said it, but the, the time in your life, could you relate to him in some way? Completely, yeah. Um, it's a... When you get older, it's a very provocative time. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, I don't know, there's a lot more introspection. Um, younger and middle age, you're doing, uh, the focus is out. And when you go beyond that um, and kids are grown up and out the door and your career path is you know, moving towards retirement, maybe, or it's not, um, it, it, it's not a, a real ambitious phase in terms of uh, got to get the next film, got to get the next show for an actor or whatever. Um, it's time to uh, take stock. Um, I think of my parents a lot more. 
not when they were younger, but when they were older. Um, mm -hmm. So it's, it's a real uh, reflective time. Uh, and this character has a jolt and uh, he's trying to deal with um, kind of the, the post-trauma, but also um, what, what life presents him in terms of the jolt of meeting this mysterious person at, at this exact moment in time at that phase to yeah. carry him as a catalyst yeah onto the next you know light yeah. at the end of the tunnel and i want to be careful we don't give too much away because i i you know i i did i, I just I, do that no yeah. you did no, you did it perfectly did it. you're you're you, awesome you did it, Steve. You did it perfectly <laughs> dana and, you, and... you have my permission to go <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's all good. It's all good. You did just right. You know, okay. because I think, it, you know, throughout, I, you know, the movie, there's just things that you're, you're thinking, you know, as, as a viewer, you know, questioning. Um, right. And, they're, and they're answered later in the movie, for sure. But right. um, Suzanne, how did you get involved in this project? Well, I had been doing some independent series and films. And this uh, friend of mine, a, a well-known independent series uh, film producer, Dottie Facito, uh, sent me the script and like Steven, I related to it because my husband is thinking of retiring and mm -hmm. I like doing films with good messages. And Dana, I think you'll remember this. The first time we met for lunch, he had just, he had told me how um, he was just, he was in the process of casting and he really thinks he's going to do something with the person that just read and he's going on and on. And then he says, Oh, his name is Steven Schnetzer. And I said, pass Winthrop. But like Cass Winthrop, like well, everybody knows him. I'm like, I'm in, I'm in the project if he's on this. Yeah, you're you you're a big soap fan, correct? I am. I was I another world your show. Another world. I would I'm an NBC person, but I'll have to say, um, in college, kind of watched all of them, but always been NBC since I'm a, I was about 13 years old. Okay. And, and Dana, <laughs> there you go. I, got, exactly. I just want to say, I, I uh, <laughs> fast confession for about a summer, I was, I was completely roped into I, it. Was the guiding light? Sorry, Steve. Yes, I, I, that's I, what I, I was before you Stephen, arrived. Stephen but was I, our I, guiding light. I recently, I recently read that Nola Reardon, the actress who played her, uh, passed away. Yes, and, and had immediately called my mother. Because uh, she, Lisa she, Bratton. she completely roped me in that summer. <laughs> Lisa Brown is what roped me in probably yeah. too. Yeah, I grew I was... up on, on, on Guiding Light and As the World Turns and then yeah. ended up working for both shows. Oh, wow. Um, oh, yeah, cool. Lisa, Lisa, that was a tragic, tragic loss. Yeah. Um, I, I didn't get to hear your answer. What, uh, where did the story idea for this come uh, from? Right. So you were, telling, you were telling what the movie was about. Right, right. So the the impetus was it's inter it's it's kind of a it's it's sort of a disjointed story in the sense that uh, just before my first son was born uh, in 2003, I had this idea that I should go to a drawing class in New York City. So I signed up for the Student Arts League, and I went and went there and and learned that I'm really not a very good drawer <laughs> but but there was but a woman. those are good things to learn i could tell you i am not either <laughs> <laughs> there was a woman now she wasn't the spitting image blah 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 but she had the mannerisms and the you know uh, uh, and certain characteristics that were very reminiscent of somebody from my my uh 20s before i met my wife and it definitely made my head spin <laughs> and and nothing came of it uh, in terms of a, a script or anything. I uh, initially, I, I actually wrote it into a short story. Uh, and then I got to a certain point and I was like, I have no idea what I'm doing with this or where, where these where these characters are going or anything. And so I just put it into a, my file of stories that are undone uh, and then cut to about 13 years later, maybe, no, 14 years later, uh, in June of 2017, and I was with my parents and my sister, uh, and I was up uh, in the Boston area for a wedding, and my mother, uh, we had this big heart-to-heart -heart conversation, and she was talking to me about 
downsizing and retirement and and you know like who's and what if and when they sell their house and who's going to get what and it was very heavy and my father was having a difficult time uh at that moment uh with uh with a friend of his who was very ill uh who was a law partner of his and so as i was i think that i think that we all create stories or use stories as a way of healing. And so as I was driving back to Ridgewood, which is where I live, uh, that story that I put away years earlier suddenly popped in my mind. And by the time I got home, I had the entire story mapped out in my head. And then I wrote it over the next month. So it was really wow. something. And and it's really funny to think that I was- You didn't get in an accident. <laughs> yeah, I've got it. Whoa! <laughs> exactly. So, if I did that, was... I would have slowed down unconsciously to thirty miles per hour. <laughs> <laughs> How long ago was that, Dana? So, so that was so that was two thousand. That was June two thousand seventeen. I wrote the script. I didn't tell anybody, not even my wife, about that I was going to write this. It was like completely private and secret until I got all the way through it, which took me about a month. And then I started getting feedback on it. And literally a, a year later, we were in production. So it was actually, it was wow. very swift. Swift to write, swift to, swift to shoot, swift to edit, finished it, the editing the following year. And then, bam, COVID. <laughs> You're welcome. You're welcome. Not so fast, a case of blue. <laughs> hurry up and wait for the pandemic. Yeah, yeah right. hurry up and, and halt. halt right. no, just, uh, I just read something today. We're entering year three of it. Yeah. Wow. Next yeah. year, I mean, wow. you know, a couple of months and it's the, the beginning of the third year of all of this. Yeah. So. strange journey that we've all the world's been on strange days indeed and but i digress let's get back to the film <laughs> <laughs> steven speaking um dana took a class um are you artist i know you're artistic as an actor but artistic in in the uh hand drawing i'm probably worse than dana uh, and you. <laughs> i saw his drawings <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but you know my, my wife who uh, one of the things i told you or before the show uh about autumn is my wife she says this you know everybody was it was put in their heads when somebody stood out in art class as a child it made you feel bad and you felt less than and etc cetera, etc cetera. she said anybody can make art and you always you just have to do it and you get better. You just get better if you do it. But it, you know, it, it, we, we get a block and it's, uh, and we stop and we never do it. And, uh, and, and, and we do ourselves a disservice because uh, it can be very therapeutic. I did go to the art students league and took uh, some drawing classes um, and uh, you know. Leading up to the film. Yes, yes. Uh -huh. Oh, did you? Before you before we before we rolled, you did? Yeah. I didn't know that. That's very that's very awesome. Well, you, you're not gonna hold his, up any of your your an actor drawings? has to keep his secrets, you know. <laughs> oh, I see. That's that's yeah. really cool. You know, it's funny about Student Arts League because I had like this this I hadn't gone there since two thousand and three and had like this romanticized idea in my head of how it was going to look. So this was uh you know six months before we were shooting. So I, I just waltzed in there. Uh, and, and first off the, the front, the exterior was covered, like they were doing construction. So like the complete, the front of it, the facade of it was completely messed up. And so I went inside and I was like, well, it's going to be great to see that art room again and the light pouring in and the, you know, and all this stuff. And it was, it was like completely utilitarian and I couldn't believe it. I was like, wow, I like completely romanticized this idea in my head of how this art, art studio should be. And then it just so happened that, so I live in Ridgewood, New Jersey, and there's an art studio in town, Ridgewood Art Institute, that- great, I was What like, a great set that was. I, yeah, I walked in and I'd never been in there before. And I was like, cause I like, after going to the Student Arts League, I was like, this really isn't gonna fit this so good. But I went into this art studio in town, which is literally five minutes from my house. And the, the Northern light, it was like amazing. And what I learned was that the architect who built that studio actually designed the Student Arts League. But then I guess 
the some sort of building was like erected in front of where the northern light should come in so it kind of like screwed up their their game in new york city but so so what we had the romanticized vision of the student arts league <laughs> was appropriately five minutes from my house it was really quite and, and that's that. where he took the class that's where he yes went? yes oh wow right. that was a beautiful the, beautiful beautiful room beautiful. very great it was a great set very evocative it was a great space to work in yeah it, it, yeah right, totally <laughs> I, I hope that the film may inspire someone to draw because it's something, and I think during the pandemic, a lot of great art art was created because mm -hmm. it's something that you don't need anything except a pencil and some paper to do. And it's, exactly. you know, with all of the technology these days, it's just something that, like Stephen said, anyone has the ability to create art. Yeah, they really do. I mean, yeah. you know, digitally, it's it's even something. Uh, to master. Suzanne, tell tell everybody who's watching what a producer does. I know it's different on every production, but it, generally, and then what you did as a producer for this film. Sure. Well, there's a lot of different kinds of producers. There's above the line and below the line. I'm usually above the line. I do different things for different films. Sometimes if I'm involved early on, I'll help with some of the major um, decisions or some of the casting. Uh, for mm -hmm. Case of Blue, I came on during production, um, but I'm mostly acting as a producer of marketing and distribution. So when the film was completed, I helped secure a platform for it, the distribution, work on the marketing. Um, we're going through the different windows now. Um, and there's a lot that goes into that. Alan, you're in PR, so you know how hard it is to do things. Mm -hmm. But anytime I work on a film for any decision, I'm always thinking about what can we do to get viewers to watch the film and enjoy the film? Because you need eyeballs on your film. And the way that independent film um, has evolved through the pandemic and even a little bit prior to the pandemic, it's getting harder for independent filmmakers to make money. And I certainly hope they come up with some other kind of uh, distribution method. Um, so it's very tricky being a producer, trying to get it out there. And um, there's definitely a skill and just luck in getting your um, film right. placed anywhere. I, my, I basically started my career in film at Disney in the marketing department. Oh. Mm -hmm. N not independent. <laughs> this makes definitely, a whole lot easier. <laughs> definitely not independent. You know, I was there during the Little Mermaid and Beauty and the Beast and Lion oh. King time, so it was it was something. Mm. Um, <laughs> uh, Stephen, please talk about working with uh, Tracy and An A how do you pronounce Annapurna? Anna Annapurna Shriram. Shriram, thank yeah. you. They were, uh, and I meant to ask that before, and I apologize because I normally. <laughs> like to pronounce it correctly. <laughs> as long as you get Glazer, Schnetzer, and Curry right. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. Good answer. Uh, <laughs> Talk um, about your co-stars, please. They, it, they were dream. They were dream boats. They were just great to work with. And um, did you know either prior? No, I did not know either. Um, I didn't. I didn't know Ken. Uh, who plays my best friend yeah. is a relative of Dana. Um, yeah. He kept oh, his really? family there. Yeah, yeah that's um, awesome. But is a yeah. um, a Bo an actor out of Boston, my hometown. So yeah. um, they were they were just great. It was easy peasy to work with them. Um, Dana was encouraging, so uh, we we would do a, a bit of improv, uh, but we stuck really closely to the script. Um, and we just uh it was really smooth they were they were lovely to work with but it was hot remember it's hot it was yeah. the summer it was hot. Remember those yeah. things Suzanne. Yeah. <laughs> hey steven's in florida now I've that that's gonna that. be hotter <laughs> it was it was really great working with with steven and and annapurna and tracy and ken and and primarily because uh, they really elevated what I had written. You know, when you when you go into this sort of thing, if you're like stuck on this is the script and you just read the lines and that's how it is, it's, mm -hmm. it never comes out the way it should. And what they were really able to do was was take what I did and elevate it. And and there were points where I asked them, let's let's work this out. Let's improvise it. Let's play around with it. 
And I think a lot of the some of the better a lot of the better moments in the movie were a product of that. And and that was really an amazing thing. And the other thing I just want to say is that uh, really it was it was such a joy working with Stephen uh, in particular, as well as the other actors, because they Stephen and the other actors are in the moment of a scene and which it's really amazing where if something so there's a scene in Washington Square Park, for example. And there's a moment in the movie where Stephen and, and Anna Parna are leaned up against the Washington Par Square Park uh, fountain. And this bicyclist comes roaring fast <laughs> and almost runs Stephen over. <laughs> Only in New York. And, and, I, and I think any lesser actor would have been like, what the hell? <laughs> Got it. Cut. <laughs> Cut. Let's do that again. And instead, it was just like in the moment, whatever's happening, you know, just go with it. I and mean, that that was the joy of of it. it was every take was like it was happening for the first time ever. And that was a real that was such a joy. So that that little moment that I'm describing is in the film because right. it was well, a that, lot. That's Stephen's you know? experience in daytime television when you don't get yeah. really an opportunity to redo it. <laughs> Right. Well, that's about the nicest thing you could say to an actor, Dana. Thank you. <laughs> well, um, I also, you know, having what Dana just said about it, ele you elevating the script. When I read scripts, I have a certain picture in my mind of what it will end up looking like. And this surpassed all of my expectations. And Stephen, the, the way you portrayed the character, and I don't want to give anything away, but at the end of the movie, I just wanted to give you a big hug and say it's going to be okay. <laughs> because you were just so convincing in that role. Thanks, Susan. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, uh, let's throw some kudos back. Uh, you know, Dana, <laughs> no, a lot of people would be threatened uh, to do what you did. Um, and it's, it's a collaborative art form. And, um, you know, actors know when something feels um, organic coming out of their mouths. And when it doesn't, and if you need to tweak things, Dana was always willing to uh, to listen and 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 really collaborate and work hard uh, to take it to the next level. So that was really important. Thank you. Uh, a lot of people get doctrinaire and very protective and defensive, and and then you, you you're you're stuck, you know. And Dana, this was your first uh, drama, right? You've spent most of your career doing documentaries. But yeah, I had I I did uh I did some feature documentaries prior to this. So I mean, it's an interesting thing in the sense of uh, of the the different forms. I mean, for me, it's all storytelling. It's how you know shaping a story. Mm -hmm. You know, with a documentary, you're shaping you know real people, real. You're you're creating an arc. You're shaping it out of a lot of footage. You know, you have your you're taking all these piece puzzle pieces and putting them together in a in a way. Uh, and and it's and and whereas a, a narrative drama like this is is prescripted, but there's still that spontaneity and 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 taking those lot you know those moments that feel alive and putting them together. So it's so for me, it's all you know filmmaking is filmmaking. It's just a you know different different approaches to it. But yeah, it's a screen uh, documentary. Uh, you know, I love I love it all. I love I love working, and it's and very much when you're working with uh, non actors or or with, you know just subjects in a documentary, you're still trying to coax a performance out of them. You're still trying to capture that you know the essence of who they are, of what what it is that you're going for. Hmm. It's all storytelling. Yeah, yeah. Well, is it true that you started making films at nine with your grandfather? Yes, Alan. It's true. <laughs> so is he uh is your grandfather responsible he's fully responsible <laughs> uh my grandfather uh god bless his soul he he was uh very very wonderful to me when i was growing up and i saw something on television that was this little kid making these animated movies with a super eight movie camera and my grandfather had a super eight movie camera i said grandpa Let's make let's make a movie. 
And he said, well, all right, Dana, well, you get the story and you come up with the characters. And you." And, and at the time it was claymation. I realized I have no patience for, for animation. But at the time it was claymation, you know. And so he told me and, and I, then I built this entire like set in my basement uh, at the age of nine. And and then we went and shot the whole thing. And I called it uh, Dane Grant Productions. Uh, and that still stands uh, today. So that's I did that for a number of years, and then I just graduated out of claymation. I <laughs> have the that's, patience for that. <laughs> I love that. That's a great story. Thank you, Thank Stephen. You. Can you remind us who, who or what influenced you on becoming an actor? Mr. Chisholm, in high school, my my it senior year English teacher. Oh, English teacher. Yeah, he was going to direct a. Uh, a play called Charlie's Aunt, which was a, a farce that Jack Benny actually starred in a little known movie. Mm. And it was a cross-dressing role. Yeah. Um, I mm. played, so he said, I want you to come out for this play. And I'd never thought of going out for a play before. So uh, he saw something theatrical in me. <laughs> so and, wait, uh, you had a cross-dressing role in high school. There, that was preparation for another world. Exactly. <laughs> I didn't realize that. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I played, um, we were uh, three Oxford buddies um, and two of them had girlfriends they wanted to propose to. But back in the turn of the century, last century, um, uh, you needed a chaperone and Charlie's aunt was supposed to come from Brazil, but she had been delayed. So they, the girls would not meet them without a chaperone. And so they put a dress on me. I played Lord Fancourt Baberly. <laughs> and his nickname was Fan, Fanny Babs. And so they put a dress on Fanny Babs and all hell <laughs> ensued. <laughs> but, you know, we did it like two performances or one performance from, in the high school gym for, the, for this, the whole school turned out. And all of a sudden I, I was just, uh, it was a peak experience. Um, they laughed, they got the humor, um, they thought we were funny. I, I don't know, it just, uh, yeah, I, I was floating after that experience. I did a couple of more high school plays. I went away to university and um, I didn't think of acting as a serious profession. You know, I'm from New England, a, a very practical part of the country. And back then, there weren't many, you know, New England, Massachusetts residents that went on to uh, Hollywood. Um, now there are, you know, there's Affleck and Damon and on and on and on. Uh, uh, Schnetzer, no. Um, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and so I kept going out for plays. West Side Story is out right now. My big college epiphany experience was playing Bernardo in West Side Story. And that, that was a um, that was a production that um, was a combined production between the music, dance, and theater departments. It was a big thing, big deal, and we did a you know major character work and uh, animal study and and uh, improvisation, and I just loved it, man. So I kept doing you know throwing myself into these college productions, and and then one thing led to another. So. Do you have, because I know you, you did a lot of stage roles. Do you have a favorite stage role that you've played? Oh, gosh. Uh, you know, the reason I like Dana's film is because I like carrying the ball. I carried the ball as cast when I was given storyline. You know, it succeeded or failed on, on my shoulders and my, my mm -hmm. partner, be mm -hmm. it Frankie or whomever, Lila, whatever, uh, Cecile, Kathleen. Um, and uh, it's the same with, with Dana's movie. Uh, I had to, you know, I was the guy and I, I like that responsibility. And uh, there's something about being out there the whole time or being on stage from the opening curtain to the end um, that. And you are in this film. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so my favorite stage role, I think I, I did three productions of Edward Albee's The Goat or Who is Sylvia? And my character enters, in, you know, right at the top of the show, and he's on all the whole time until the bloody end, and I mean that literally. Wow. And um, for one thing, it really cuts the nerves. You know, you're you're you're, ang you're anxious or have a little stage fright, but once you step on and start going moment to moment, 
it's like being on a roller coaster and it, the ride it, takes you right. and all of a sudden you're standing in front of an applauding audience and think god that that was the fastest <laughs> hour and a half of my life <laughs> where to uh, go yeah so yeah uh albies play the goat i i did it uh I was understudying um, Bill Pullman on Broadway, and I got to do a dozen performances there. And then I did a production of that uh, at the Arena Stage in Washington, D.C., a great production, and another great production with uh, up in Boston at the Lyric Stage Company. Oh, wow. That's great. Suzanne, you've worked with a ton of daytime actors, Stephen, Cassie DePaiva, Nathan Purdy, Katie McLean. Trent Dawson and Martha Byrne. How did you start working with daytime actors? Well, I have to say it's Martha Byrne. Um, I was doing I was doing some PR for a girl on a reality show. Martha, who lives in the same town as me, um, was her manager. So that's how I met her. Then I get a call from Martha about a month later saying I'm acting, I'm putting together an acting school. Michael Park was one of the yeah. teachers. The late Lisa Brown was a teacher. Will you do my PR? And I said, sure. I'm like, this is like a dream job to me. And then <laughs> I did PR. She had a web series called Gotham. I did a little PR for that. Then she was, Martha's very talented. She's a producer. She's a writer. She's an actress. She was putting together a TV pilot called Wait. And by then I had known Which her. Which was pretty, great. Thank I, you. I was there. That thank was great. you. Were you at that party in New York? For I that? was, yeah. Okay. So that was, yeah. A long so time ago. <laughs> I was, it was. Uh, and I wanted to mention that party. Um so I, I asked her, can I get more involved? Can I come on as a producer? And I did. And she filmed it out in Hollywood um, in this great studio and overlooking the Hollywood sign. And I said, oh, boy, this is what I want to do. Um, and then, yeah, we had this great premiere party in the city. And I don't know if you remember, Alan, but it was um, an actress that didn't come out very often, came out for that party. And we had one of the soap photographers follow her into the bathroom and Every all the male, the male soap media was just like, we can't go into the bathroom. We're men. Um, and it was just it was a crazy night. And I don't know was, if I remember that. <laughs> yeah, well, that was behind the scenes because I was doing okay. PR. You just saw all the good parts. Of yeah, it. I was I was just yeah, I was just attending. So I that's very funny. That's yeah, very funny. So that was great. And then after Martha, I ended up through a different um, producer. I ended up meeting Sonia Blanjardo, who directs Days, mm -hmm. yeah. who did this Emmy-nominated series, Tainted Dreams, with Alicia Menchu. Um, she, she's going to be uh, she's going to be a guest in January. Oh, that's wonderful. That's I'm wonderful. doing a I'm doing a direct a daytime director show. Stephen. Oh, that's wonderful. She's so talented, also, great. And, and she's a joy to work with. So I, I just ended up, scripts got sent to me and they ended up having daytime people in them. I mean, I think Wade had Trent and now I work with Trent on his um, Katona Classic stage. He's got this new theater up in Katona, New yeah. York. He's doing phenomenal with that. Katie I would McClain, love, yeah, I want to get up there. I it's, get up. It's, it's really nice. I went for his last play. Um, and then Katie McLean, I met online, but we had mutual friends. So I was producer on her um, documentary, Seeing is Believing, Women Direct. And we're going to work on some projects in the future. In fact, I'm, I'm seeing her later this week. So, you know, the it, it's funny that, you know, it, to me, it's a dream job because I'm working with these people that I've watched for so long. Mm -hmm. But it also just shows how talented because the daytime people aren't, they, they don't stay in daytime. They just go out and do so much else. Right. They they are incredibly talented, like Mr. Schnitzer, and as Dana can attest to. Um, Dana, in 1998, you won a Student Academy Award for your graduate thesis, Intermesso. Um, Take take me back to 1998. Tell me what <laughs> tell me tell me what that was. I'd and, like to and... take us all back to 1998. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that was a uh, uh, a film I did. It's interesting you should bring this up because I, I, I've always felt that there was uh, some uh, thematic tissue between uh, A Case of Blue and the, that film, which is called Intermezzo. Uh, and that film was about a recent retiree who... Wait, stop. Let me start again. I, was, I was like, wait. <laughs> let's start again. I'm was, like, that's very similar. <laughs> that, that, that film, uh, Intermezzo, is about a... Um, uh, a a violinist uh, who discovers that there's a ghost in his house and the ghost is a flautist and they escape by playing music together. 
uh, and it's it's a uh, it's a romantic ghost story. So there's there's a romanticism that goes on with it. And I made the film when I was uh, 27, 28 years old, and uh, and this was. Uh, it's interesting that the actor who who, uh, who was in the, the lead, uh, Will Lyman, was the same age that you know I basically was when I made uh, A Case of Blue. So I seem to be making <laughs> sometimes making movies that are like projecting like into my future of how I see you know the future might be in some strange, weird you know kind of dreamlike way. Uh, but it was a, a that was a very meaningful film for me, uh, and it got me some attention in Hollywood. And I got an agent, and and then I was uh, uh, writing scripts for Hollywood and and doing that whole thing for a, a number of years. So it was well, winning a, an Academy Award, whether a student or not, is a pretty big deal. I mean, that you know must have been pretty exciting for you. It was. It was wonderful. My wife and I, which was my girlfriend at the time, uh, we were flown out to Los Angeles and they had this giant ceremony in, in this big theater that had like, there were like, I don't know, 500, 1,000 people there and got to meet all sorts of cool people, <laughs> all yeah. these movie stars. I was like, wow, this is really cool. <laughs> yeah, it was neat. And then we got tours of the studios. You know, it was, it was really, it really was very much uh, a dream of mine, you know, from when I was nine years old to, to be making movies. So to, to have that trajectory and have my, my film from NYU uh, was, was very special for me and continues to be. Did that solidify sort of you had made the right decision on going into this industry? <laughs> <laughs> well, it certainly made me feel better about it. <laughs> I, I mean, it was funny because um, the the NYU uh, graduate film they, they were pretty intense over there, and uh, and the day that I found out that I won the Student Academy Award was the same day that they had my graduate thesis review. And so uh, the number of the professors were from Europe and didn't have the same kind of sensibility that I had uh, in terms of filmmaking. And so they were all like, we don't like your movie, but congratulations on the Student Academy Award. <laughs> so it was sort of like a, a nice umbrella for me to go into that situation. Uh, but, it, you know, it was a that was a very meaningful thing. Uh, and you know, certainly uh, it, it demonstrated that I was heading in the direction of where I should be going. Uh, so that was helpful. Uh, and, you know, it was a great way to, to end uh, one's career at NYU graduate film. So, yeah. Absolutely. I can't really think of a much better way. Than, <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> for, for sure. Uh, Stephen, fans, you know, have been asking um, about this lovely lady. Um, <laughs> you know, they all know that you two are incredibly close. You guys are great friends. Can you just talk about Linda? I recently spoke to her and, uh, you know, she, she she's a dynamite woman. She sure is. Um, she's pretty dependable. You know, she's a powerhouse and always has been. Um, she's just, uh, got a real life force and, uh, we love each other dearly and deeply. And, um, um, being in South Florida is tricky because I can't go to her house for her Christmas party. You know, it's, uh, <laughs> yeah, which it's I think probably... is this, is this weekend? I was um, going to say, it's probably very soon. Yeah. 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 And, uh, no, she's a great friend and extremely loyal, um, and so talented. When you look back on those 14 years, 14, right at another world? 17. 17. Oh, yeah. What, what, you know, what immediately comes to mind? Oh, too many things uh, come, come to mind. It, it's, uh, we were given so many fun stories to run with. Um, and so I think the main thing is the writers and producers had faith in their actors and 
they would present stories that featured various of us. And then as the story developed, they would see what we were bringing to it. And a little like what Dana was talking about, uh, and they would use our tendencies to, to raise, raise the bar even more. Um, and there was a flexibility there and there was a sense of fun there and it was just a great company. You know, a lot of people went in, it came in and out of those doors out at that studio. Um, a lot of terrific people and there were hardly, there was hardly one clunker. I mean, it was just, <laughs> it was, it was such good fortune that way, you know? Well, there That's was, so fun. There was that. No, never mind. Uh, <laughs> there was that one. There was that one. Well, one of your fans said, "Sorry for this fan blush, Mr. Schnetzer. You are blush still away. <laughs> you are still absolutely handsome and studly as ever. And your work on Another World with Linda Dano, Godspeed. <laughs> Happy holidays and Godspeed to you too." <laughs> um, Dana. In 2014, your documentary, The Evolution of Dad, was invited to play at a little place called the White House. Uh, yeah. That... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, a Student Academy Award, you know, your documentary is invited to, to play at the White House. Tell us about the documentary and, and how the White House thing came to be. So, <laughs> <laughs> so... Uh, when my son was born in 2003, uh, I spent an inordinate amount of time taking care of him. And, uh, and I was feeling a little detached because I was in New Jersey, you know, writing for, for Hollywood. And, and at a certain point, it became, there was a, like a disconnect for me. Uh, and I was talking to a friend of mine. And he said to me, you should make a documentary. He was actually, he won a Student Academy Award as well. We're, we're friends from NYU. He said, you should make a documentary about the changing role of fatherhood. I was like, huh. So then I went, great idea. you know, I got a camera and, uh, and I, I spent the next three years uh, off and on shooting this documentary and following all these dads. And, uh, and it was a very powerful, transformative experience, as fatherhood is for anybody who's ever been a father. Uh, so that was really something else. Uh, that was the film was made and it came out actually in, in 2010. Uh, but what, Alan, what you were talking about in 2014, I, out of the blue, I, I got an email from and it was interesting because it was through Joe Biden's uh, office the office at that time of the vice president uh, and it was his legal counsel, <laughs> I guess who had been assigned to find uh, p filmmakers or, or people, dads or people who are representative of fatherhood because they were having this fatherhood summit. Uh, oh, wow. And that was, and so I, I remember getting this email and I was like, and then, and then I spoke to the guy on the phone <laughs> and, and I was like, Please invite me to the White House. Please invite me. <laughs> <laughs> and it was like, would you like to come to the White House? And I'm like, yes, I think that would be great. <laughs> <laughs> so it was really, um, that was, that was actually, uh, so that was June 9th, uh, uh, 2014. And I, I remember that day very particularly because at that time I was making the short documentary about Jim and Sarah Brady. And, oh, and so, wow. and so mm -hmm. I went, it was like, go to the White House. This is my day. Go to the White House and be a part of this thing where they presented my film and it was really awesome. Uh, and then schlep on over to a hotel and I can't remember which one it was, but it was like five minutes walking distance from the White House to this hotel where Sarah Brady was giving this special talk mm -hmm. and and it was like, wow, an awesome thing. And then I was directing on the same day that I was getting, it was just great. It was a very, very meaningful, special day. And it's like, you know, there, there are certain days where it's like, you know, that, that really hit it. And that was, that was certainly one of them for me. Is that documentary available anywhere if, if folks wanted to see Absolutely. the evolution of dad? Yeah. So if you go to evolutionofdad.com, 
uh there's you can watch it it streams on vimeo there's you can also uh get the dvd if you want to be old school about it like me <laughs> <laughs> i still do these dvds uh, and, that's so uh, funny yeah, yeah absolutely it, it sounds that really sounds like an incredible documentary well thank you thank you yeah, it's actually I, it's it's used in over 200 colleges and universities across the country and the world uh for gender studies programs so it's really, you know, it's impactful in that way. And I, I think that that's, you know, a big part of why I did it. So what, what a legacy almost for your son, too, in some, you know, because it was at that time when you were. Yeah. Wow. That's thank you. Thank I love you. that. I love that. Suzanne, Wait, I'm uh, getting to learn so much about you during this. <laughs> <session>. <laughs> all the secrets, all the secrets. Suzanne, do you have a favorite project that you've worked on to date? Well, aside from Case of, you know, it's hard to say. Um, <laughs> I love Case of Blue, but I'm going to shout out to Tainted Dreams because that was filled with the daytime stars and The Real Housewife and some other stars and got to go to the Emmys twice for that. So that was a whole lot of fun. I, yeah, I, I, I need to really watch that. I, I never, I, I know a lot of great, I mean, Sonia did it, but I, I know a lot of great people were in it as well. It's got a it's got a great storyline and it, you know, it's we're always contemplating another season. It's very hard to do another season and Sony's involved in so many things, but it takes off in a uh, trage trajectory that is more like modern drama than soaps are. So it's it's it tackles some tough issues. Hmm. Stephen, another fan said they they almost got to see you in the Waverly Gallery a few years back. Do you have a dream role that you'd still like to play? I never went for dream role. You know, um, some it's a common question. And it's common because a lot of people do, you know, I won't die happy unless I've played Hamlet or, or Lear or somebody in between. Um, but um, no, my my aspiration is to find good material and be cast in it and work with good people. That, that's, that's a dream to me come true. That collaborative when you, family feeling. When you decided to, to make this your profession, were there acting role models you had at that time? Um, probably uh, a bunch of the Brits, you know, mm. You know, when I, when I came out of college, the last production I was in qualified for the American College Theater Festival. We were one of 10 productions that were invited from around the country. It was invited to um, Washington, D.C. It was under the auspices of the Kennedy Center. So we did this, uh, we had done this body send up of Aristophanes, the clouds. And... Um, and we performed it three times in Ford's theater. And there was a director named Gerald Friedman, who's a very well-known director, and then went on to uh, found and run the North Carolina School of the Arts Theater Department. And Jerry just passed away about a year ago. Um, and he was my first professional father. Hmm. Um, he met me after our opening in Ford's, the at Ford's theater. There was a, a mixer afterwards. And he said, what are you going to do this summer, Stephen? And I said, I really don't know. Go back to UMass and maybe do some theater with my theater buddies. And he said, do you want to audition for me? I'm doing Time of Athens uh, for Joe Papp's Theater in Central Park at the Delacorte. And I said, are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I had never auditioned before. I went home <laughs> <laughs> went to my, one of my friends and said, what's an audition? No, um, we scrambled. I put together I put together Once More Under the Breach from Henry V. He watched me do it a few times, gave me some suggestions. I drove from Amherst, Massachusetts in a bug, a Volkswagen bug, four plus hours. <laughs> got out just 15 minutes. I'd never driven to New York before. Um, got out, no GPS, mind you. Uh, got out. <laughs> 15 minutes before found your way. I arrived. What's that? You found your way without the GPS. You no, know, we, we managed back then. I don't know how now, but we did. And I went in, uh, was in for four minutes, auditioned. Uh, thank you very much, Stephen. Good to see you. 
And uh, and then I got my bug and drove back to Amherst, you know. A couple of days later, Jerry uh, offered me um, spear carrier and understudy for 85 bucks a week and the promise of three months work. And at that time, I was also, um, I have a degree in French, minor in Spanish. I was offered a position in my hometown high school to te teach languages. And I had also applied to the Peace Corps and was offered a, a position in an ESL program teaching French uh, English to French speaking students in Morocco. So that was a real uh, crossroads uh, or a fork, a tri fork in the road. Um, and I took 85 bucks a week and the promise of three weeks, three months work. Um, I don't know. Did I answer your question in there somewhere? Yeah, you did. You did. <laughs> I, went off on a tangent there, but, I mean, uh, the Delacorte theater is, you know, my God, legendary. Yeah. Legendary. And then I ended up going on as the understudy for uh, the one of the leads, the last three and a half performances. And uh, the night that I went on in, 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 after intermission for the second act, Jerry had come back with some Broadway producers because he was going to do a show that fall. And that led me to my next job and my union card. And so, um, you know, a lot of it is timing and just dumb luck. <laughs> Um, one of our fans said, how proud are you of your son? He's doing such great work. He's, what, he's what, terrific. What is that like to watch? Um, it's, a, it's an extreme joy. Uh, thank you uh, for that. Um, I, I just love it. I, I love, uh, there's no bigger fan of his than me. <laughs> I've, watched, uh, I've watched some of his movies six times at least, and I could watch it again. It was... He did a, one of his first films. I think the second one out of the gate was Pride. Um, Book Thief was his first film. And, you know, I flew over to Berlin to spend a week with him while he was filming over there. And um, Pride, I've seen six, seven times. And it was on one of my flights from Florida up to New York recently. Um, and it's, it's a magnificent film. And he's got that must movie. be pretty cool being on the plane and pop there. Yeah, <laughs> scrolling through. What am I going to see? What am I going to see? Ah, ben. <laughs> that's something I've wanted to to watch. Uh, the Last Man on Hulu, right? It's yeah. I think it's on Hulu. Yeah. Um, that's awesome. Congrats. He's great, and he's he's, he's just uh, he's really really gifted. Um, has a real very charismatic and. Uh, really good qualities uh he's light years ahead of where i was uh at, at his age at that age yeah. I, I was gonna ask if, if the opportunity to play cast again somewhere popped up would you do it yes oh in a heartbeat are you kidding me <laughs> yeah I thought, <laughs> what a great... I, I, I thought so you know you, you asked what was my favorite role I, I i talked about the stage play you know the stage work but my all-time favorite role was Cass Winthrop. I got to do that for 17 years and I actually went over to World Turns for almost two yeah. years as Hunt Block's character's lawyer and then did yeah. a stunt for five shows on Guy uh, and White as Cass. Uh, so, uh, oh, I forgot. Yeah. I was going to, I couldn't remember if it was Cass that you brought over to Guiding Light. Yeah, Ellen Wheeler had me come over. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. I was hoping that would stick, but we they, they only had five days for me. So. Um, oh, and and we need Steve. We need Steve Olson to come back to days too. Well, you just start the movement, Suzanne. Do a little PR <laughs> yeah. for me. <laughs> I, I love Hump Block. He cracks me up. He's a he's, he's a funny. He's great. I love him. Yeah, he's a, he's a funny guy. Dana, is there a documentary out recently that you have admired? Uh, you know, something that you. Hmm. Yeah, there's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Like which one? I, I was somewhat pummeled by watching. Uh, there's a there's a documentary called Adrian, uh, which is about Adrian a, Adrian Shelley. Uh, it, she, she was she was a um, uh, an actress in the early '90s who was like the indie queen. She was in a, a bunch of Hal Hartley movies, most notably a film called Trust. Uh, and she she actually wrote and directed the film Waitress, which is now you know Broadway show. Oh yeah. yeah. Uh, and and I I had it's the a good movie. Yeah. Uh, and she was she tragically murdered 
in 2006. Uh, now and, that ring, rings a bell. I think maybe when I saw Waitress, somebody told me about that yeah, story. Yeah, and, and I, I had the opportunity to meet her, I think probably about 1996, in front of the Angelica movie theater. She was doing something for them, and I saw her on the street, and I, I was so enamored by this film, Trust, which you can't even find. <laughs> But but it's such a it's such a it was such a uh, fundamental film for me when I was uh, I was studying away in England and anyway I'm going off on a long tangent here but but anyway it was a very uh, a very very powerful movie uh, that was that was really done by her her husband uh, and trying to you know re rekindle her memory uh, and 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 go th and explore it with his 15 year old daughter who was three years old when she died. So it was very powerful for me. And, you know, and I was very pummeled by it. <laughs> there's a, there's a, there's a long winded answer for you. No, that's amazing. Um, what's next for you? Ah, so uh, I'm, I'm actually uh, doing in the research stages of not a film, but a, it's, it's more of like a, a, a locational uh, detective game that will be in my general area where I live, uh, which is it, it'll play somewhat like Twin Peaks, uh, in which there's somebody who's missing and you have to go and piece together this mystery of what happened to her by all these videos that that uh, and, and it's like a it's like a big puzzle. Uh, and it, it will delve into all sorts of interesting backstory and history and anyway something I've but it's been... not a, it's not a movie though not a movie no it's not a movie okay. <laughs> so, so it's something so I... it's actually something it's something i wanted to do before a case of blue i was actually like starting to like really it, shape it is up it like li then... live theater no no it's going to be uh web-based uh, or phone yeah. like app based where you mm. basically in order to solve the thing it's it's a, you have to watch the video and like piece together what's what's happened but you actually have to go to locations where it took place because the video will only tell you a certain amount so it's sort of like it's like basically i'm designing a feature length film shooting it at shooting all these little pieces that will play into the film and then throwing the pieces here, here, and here, and here. And you have to go and explore and find what happened to this person and figure it out. So it's, so, you know, I, I'm very involved with, uh, with the Ridgewood community and, and uh, you know, a, a good portion of the film was shot here in Ridgewood. And I'd like to do things that are based where I'm located. It's, you know, awesome. especially having, having three kids and a dog. Uh, I'm, this is my world and i'm very involved with the community here and the people who run the 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 local the government and you know i've been involved in all sorts of different ways on the arts council and so this is uh, a, another way of sort of exploring uh the town uh but doing it in a, in a way that kind of will bring i think bring people to ridgewood as a as a just as a uh, a, yeah. a destination, add an extra layer of like intrigue to the place to come here, and there will be you know I'll be casting it like a film and you know having characters awesome. and such. Uh, I haven't even told you about this, Susanna. Sorry. <laughs> Phenomenal. <laughs> no, you, you wouldn't believe how the community came together and participated in a case of blue. It was yeah. It was something to behold. Are Are you born and raised in Ridgewood? Not at all. Uh, okay. <laughs> I'm just adopted. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I, I think I think like, like, uh, uh, one Steven, of our I'm, guiding. I'm, I'm from the Boston area. Okay, I think one of our guiding light actresses lives there. Oh yeah, who's that? If she's still there, Michelle Ray Smith. I'm not sure if she's still there. Huh. I have to ask. Huh. I, I know she was for for a period. And Suzanne, you have a talk show you're working on, right? I do. Uh, but first, I just want to say, Alan, thank you for having me on on this You're talk show. You're very welcome. Um, it's <laughs> just it's a mecca for soap fans. You know that, right? <laughs> um, I thank am. You. I started a show called The Libby Show, Lunch with the Ladies, and it's it's targeted towards women over a certain age. I had started it a couple of years ago, didn't really go anywhere with it. And then during the pandemic, I gave new birth to it. And we just launched the first season in December. That's awesome. Good luck with it. There, I mean, the pandemic that, you know, it's so interesting. I mean, there are so many things that came out of that. You know, this is one of them. I, 
you know, if you would have asked me this two years ago, I would n never have imagined I'd be sitting here talking to you three or, you know, having something, you know, of my own like this. So, but really guys, thank you so much. Best of luck with the case of blue. Stephen, thank best you. of luck in Florida. Thanks, Alan. En enjoy. It's great to see you as always, Suzanne. Thank you, Dana. Best of luck. I, I'm going to look for the, you know, I want to watch your documentary. Oh, thank you, Alan. Really, I really it's such a pleasure. And, and really, thank you so much. Your, your questions were really fantastic. Really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Thanks for, for spending the hour with us. And A Case of Blue is available on all streaming platforms. Uh, go check it out. I loved it. Loved it. And uh, I think you'll really enjoy it's it. All, it's also available uh, on, on the website at acaseofblue.com for, for those who want to watch, you know, like get a DVD of it and that sort of thing. That's great. Uh, Stephen, before I let you go, Christy just said, hi, Stephen. I met you in Lima, Ohio years ago when I was a teenager. <laughs> oh, yes. Christy from Lima. <laughs> hi, Christy. <laughs> but it, have, that's have the, good holidays, you know, everybody. That's the power of another world, you know, <laughs> because if she was a teenager and she's tuning in today. It really Our fans were the best, are the best. They just they are. are. Yeah. 100%. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Bye. Alan. You're Bye. so welcome. Bye. Bye. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. Don't forget, thank you to Stephen, Dana, and Suzanne for joining me today. Check out A Case of Blue. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel uh, right there down below. Turn on the notifications for reminders of all upcoming shows. Tune in tomorrow to meet uh, three incredibly talented voiceover actors. Susan Eisenberg, Maria Canals Barrera, and George Newbern. These three play Wonder Woman, Hawkgirl, and Superman in the Justice League animated series. Have a great night, everybody, and I will see you tomorrow.